All right, in the meantime, I'll start sharing my screen and we can get started. Can everybody see that? Thumbs up if you can. Perfect. All right, we can get started. The recording has also started. So thank you guys for joining both Digital and Divided and Techstars. My name is Patricia Diaz. I am the head of partner and founder of success here with Digital and Divided. And Digital Undivided is a leading nonprofit leveraging our data programs as well as advocacy to catalyze economic growth for Black and Latino women. And we have three pillars that we focus on, programs, research, and thought leadership. We have five research-driven programs um, that are best in class that are really focused on educating um, Black and Latino women at every stage of their entrepreneurial journey, as well as giving them resources, advisory, and investment. Along with our research, we have authoritative research led by women of color and provides both qualitative and quantitative insights into the state of Latino and Black women entrepreneurs. And then we also have thought leadership. So as an org, we are solving deeply rooted systemic issues, and we are uniquely positioned um, to lead the global cultural shift towards inclusive entrepreneurship and our efforts are spurring global attention conversations and as well as resources for women of color businesses with us today is um, the tech stars new york accelerator powered by jp morgan more specifically our speaker is gary stewart um, who is the managing director of the tech stars uh, program he is VC backed, exited serial entrepreneur, early stage investor that has managed 1.6 billion startup portfolio, a professor who has taught entrepreneurship at Yale Law School, i.e. business school in Madrid, and has been invited to speak at various different organizations and events. This session is specifically an Ask Me Anything on fundraising and programming with Techstars, and you may ask any questions that you have regarding fundraising and the fundraising progress process, as well as any questions you may have about the Techstars program and application process. Without further ado, I'll leave it to Gary and his team. Well, thank you, Patricia. It's such an honor to be invited to kind of be here with uh, all you guys today. Um, before we go any further, since you did such a great job of introducing me, I kind of want to make sure I also uh, allow for my team to be introduced as well. So with me, um, you know, making, running Techstars New York City, powered by JP Morgan, we have Jonathan as our investment principal, Tanaka as our investment associate, and Cord recently joined as our investment analyst. I don't know if you guys wanna spend like 30 seconds just introducing yourself, maybe starting, going in that order, Jonathan, Tanaka, and then Cord. Yeah, sure. Uh, Jonathan Vo, I'm new on the team uh, from New York. Uh, spent the last few years in early stage investing. Um, and yeah, new to tech stars though, uh, but not new to tech incubators and accelerators uh, and sort of the startup world. So excited to uh, see what everyone has to ask. Hi everyone, I'm Tanaka. I worked in tech before joining Techstars as a commercial lead in food tech, food experiences, as well as food festivals um, or food festival technology. And excited to be here with you all and learn about what you're building and uh, discuss more about our team. Oh yeah, I'll awesome. do it now. All right, so Raj, we know that you're excited. Give me the ball. <laughs> all right, Cord. Lastly, I'm definitely excited to be here. Uh, I've been at Techstars uh, for a little, for over a year, but new to the Techstars New York team. So very excited about that. But prior to that, I worked at an organization called Founder Gym, where we were focused on supporting uh, underrepresented and overlooked founders. And I certainly have always been aware of the, the helpful reports and insights that Digital Unv Undivided put out. So I've always had a tremendous amount of respect for this organization. So very honored to be here. Awesome. Yes, yeah, so I think over the next like five minutes or so, we're just going to share a little bit 
about ourselves and how Techstars works. So I don't know who's controlling the slides. Uh, Tanaka sounds like, yeah. Um, so we've gone over my background. Awesome. Next slide. And a little bit about Techstars. So um, we're an accelerator, but we're also one of the world's largest pre-seed funds. And I know that sometimes people see those as kind of like the same thing, but in most case, in a lot of cases, they're not. So what do I mean exactly? It means that our model is to invest up to $120,000 in founders. Um, what we're really trying to get is a kind of uh, return on that investment, uh, something that our investors will be happy to kind of uh, see. Um, and we want to do that in a way that still makes entrepreneurship accessible to everyone, because I think underlying a lot of what we do is the notion that, you know, talent is distributed equally, but opportunity is not. And so, you know, there are a lot of great ideas out there, lots of great founders. It's not always the case that, that those opportunities um, or the, that that talent is matched up with opportunity. So that's a bit about what we're doing. But yeah, at the end of the day, we're essentially just, you know, a venture capital fund, but one that kind of focuses on the very earliest stages of investment, uh, focusing on, on companies that have probably little more than an MVP and some initial traction, which might be too early for a lot of other investors. And when we kind of look at Techstars history, because Techstars actually is one of the pioneers in this space of investing before most other um, uh, venture capitalists, we see that you know we've invested in about 3,100 companies. Those companies have gone on uh, to raise about $24 billion. They're worth almost $100 billion. Um, and I think one number that we don't have here is that 19 of them have gone on to become unicorns, which mean companies that are worth more than a billion dollars. And so since I spent the last, like I think, nine years in London, last 20 years in Europe, um, if you look at, for example, the UK, and th throughout their entire history, they've only had about 90 plus unicorns. So it tells you something when Techstars by itself, the small little organization relatively has been able to uh, help generate working with early stage founders, 19 unicorn companies. Uh, next slide, please. And so the basic idea behind what we do is that we work in cohorts. So that essentially means that we select uh, 12 companies for every program. In the, we just recently closed out one of our selection processes. Um, we got about 1,100 applications, as you'll see on a subsequent slide. And from that, we have to winnow it down to about you know, 80 to 100 companies that we reach out to and say that we'd like to get more information from um, by having a 15 minute uh, session with them, which, which you can break down into a three minute pitch, five to seven minutes of Q&A, and then uh, allowing the founders to ask us any questions they may have of us, since it is at the end of the day, a kind of relationship that we're both trying to, to build and to try to make sure that it's worthwhile. From the hundred or so companies that we interview, we then get down to about 24 companies that are finalists. These companies will then be screened by investors. Um, that's how we uh, essentially uh, try to work at least our selection process, which is to kind of go out there and find investors who are interested in the verticals that we focus on or in the demographics of the founders that we're focusing on. Um, more specifically, that means uh, health, health tech, uh, fintech, uh, ed tech, um, and then, you know, I would say a general category, which is like anything else that we see that looks really, really interesting. Um, and so we're using those investors to help us to kind of identify companies that they themselves might be interested in investing in, in at a later stage. Since going back to what I said in the last slide, the goal for us is to kind of make sure that we're doing good in the world, but also that we're making money. That at the end of the day, that really is what's driving us as well. Uh, the notion that we are looking for companies that we think we can help to become really big companies. Um, Generally, a lot of the Techstars programs are hybrid. We actually decided that our program in New York this year is going to be in person because after our interaction with a lot of the investors, you know, there's nothing like actually being in the same room, breaking bread with someone else to be able to develop a relationship. And at the end of the day, getting investment and a lot of this ecosystem is really about building relationships and networks. And that's a lot easier to do in person, you know, over wine or over a beer or just over a coffee. Uh, and so that's kind of what we're thinking there. Next slide. So the program, um, as I said in the last slide, goes over 13 weeks. And what we're really trying to do is to identify the two or three things that we can really help you with that will make it more likely that you're going to be able to secure investment. Again, going back to the idea being that we're looking to find companies that other investors will consider to be too early. And we're trying to help those companies get to a stage 
where other investors who traditionally don't invest that early will take a good look at them and hopefully put a material amount of funding into them. And so that also entails identifying the key risk factors that those businesses might have. What are the two or three things that would stop them from really getting to the next level and seeing if we might be able to help them unblock those blockers so that we can accelerate the growth of their startup. So yeah, um, because we're investors, what essentially means is that we give you some capital up to $120,000. And in exchange, we're really trying to get somewhere in the vicinity of like six to 8% of your company. So that our incentive again is, is to help you because that also helps us, right? So as investors, when you win, we win. Um, and so we're looking for those companies that we really wanna you know, embark on a journey with that may take up to the next 10 or more years. And so we're really trying to find from the hundred, you know, the 1100 applicants that we get, who are the 12 companies that we really want to bet on that we really think that going on an adventure with them over the next 10 or 12 years, whatever the number ends up being, could be one that is mutually beneficial, both in terms of people that we actually want to see win, but then secondarily in terms of making sure that our investors get the payback that we think that they, you know, should be getting. Next slide. And then in terms of like what we're looking for in a startup, you know, there is no magic formula. I mean, it's kind of like one of those, you know it when you see it or you hear the pitch kind of things. But I would think in general, there are a few factors that like everyone should be focusing on. I think first and foremost, we wanna know that you're solving a problem in a big and growing market that we should care about. So if you're creating a really great, like, you know, like I'm Jamaican, a really great Jamaican restaurant um, that's gonna serve a local community, that's awesome. Like I would, I'd probably go to that restaurant but that's not really kind of the kind of business that we can invest in. So we're looking for businesses that are in markets where there's a, they can see a problem that needs to be solved. No one is solving it kind of definitively yet. There is a possibility that this company can become the category winner, the Verb, the Facebook, the Google, the Apple, the Microsoft of its space, the Amazon, whatever. Um, and uh, finding the solution to that problem is worth a lot of money usually upwards of a billion dollars. So we wanna know that there's a big market, a big problem, and it's worthwhile to solve that solution, to solve that problem because solving it makes everyone very happy and also very wealthy. Um, second thing that we're looking for is team. So if we're gonna bet on a market and say, well, this is a big problem and someone has to solve it, then we need to know that we have conviction that your team actually has a good shot at solving it. Um, so the team is probably, for me at least, the second factor. And then the third factor would be evidence that you're actually on the road to solving it. So we, we wanna know that there's a big problem. This is the team that is going to end up being the ones that are gonna win the game, right? Um, and here's some evidence that they are on the right path. I think those are the three things that are kind of the most important in terms of helping other people to understand your full potential. And if you, for whatever reason, don't have traction, then I think that's where the fourth bit comes in, which is like a really compelling vision of how you're creating a solution that's gonna change the world, right? So to take an example that is probably in the news right now, and it's not in any way the sorts of companies or only sorts of companies that we look at, but it's really clear to understand how a product like ChatGPT or Sydney from Microsoft or whatever can change the world. Back in its day, it was really easy to see how the iPhone could change the world. There are some uh, founders that have a really compelling vision of how the world should look different um, and how they're going to help to make that happen. Uh, and so if you, for whatever reason you don't have traction, then a compelling vision about like why you are definitively on that path to changing the world um, because of this view of a problem that you have and the unique insights that you have along with it, that's great. That's the vision question there. And I think the last thing that people have to remember is it's always important to have like some sort of a secret sauce as well, right? Because if you're going through 1100 applications like we do, and maybe you can devote like five to 10 minutes per application, that's a lot of time already invested in um, the application process when we know that the average investor doesn't spend more than like, let's say four to five minutes reading a pitch deck, even when that's coming with a warm intro. So you don't really have that much time, whether in a deck or in a pitch to make a really uh, lasting impression. So you kind of have to make sure that when you do have that time, you're really leveraging it to make sure that you're memorable. And so I think that's kind of like what the secret sauce bit is for me, which is like why there are a lot of other companies out there. I only need to choose 12. I can choose, I can literally reject 99% and be guaranteed that they're gonna be, there's gonna be something interesting there. So what makes you special? What, why are you the one company that I should bet the entire farm on? 
right? And I think like founders that think like that generally help us to be able to sift through a lot of the other candidates. Because at the end of the day, it is a competition for attention and for money. And you have to help us understand why you. Next slide. So to give a little bit of like a case study, because, you know, this is my team we kind of introduced before. And, you know, we literally just went through this process, which for us is the first time that we're working together um, to select our April 2023 cohort. Um, as mentioned, we looked at about 1,100 companies that we had to evaluate uh, to make 12 investments. Um, we didn't really kind of hack it in any way um, to make sure that there was diversity, but we did make sure that when we were out there pitching, you know, ourselves and um, tech stars, that we also did events like the one that we're doing today, where we kind of focus on particular groups. So there might be some kind of self-selection element there as well. But for whatever reason, we ended up with a cohort without kind of, a, without specifically setting any sort of like targets even, where 50% of the cohort, the CEOs are black or Latino. Um, we have other teams, as you can see in the minority founding team stat, where, you know, it's a diverse team. So 83% of our teams, the teams that got into the 12 new investments have um, a member of their founding team that's a minority member, whereas 50% have a black or Latino CEO, 58% um, have a female CEO. Again, we didn't even specifically focus on gender. Um, and then a couple of other data points, 33% uh, are from New York. So it's important to us that founders are from New York, but it's not determinative. Um, and 60%, so 58% of the founders are uh, US-based, which obviously means then about 40%, uh, 42% to be exact, are non-US-based. So we're looking for founders from around the world, any race, any gender, any geography, um, we just want really great founders. And we're just making it clear that we understand that that means that um, a lot of those folks should be from underrepresented categories because there's a lot of talent in those communities. As you can see from our team, we ourselves belong in large part to those categories. So there's no reason for us to have any other presumption. Um, as I mentioned before, the five main categories that we tend to see companies coming in are um, digital health or health tech, FinTech, media and ed tech, um, a lot of like, well, I guess enterprise and consumer are very broad, but like generally those are the kinds of categories that we're seeing folks in. Um, and we're willing to look at any sort of company from any sort of business. So even though we say, you know, FinTech, health tech, ed tech, media, et cetera, um, if you think you have a really amazing idea um, that no one's thinking about, and that's exactly why we should be talking to you, please do um, let us know and apply. And in terms of like our next call, um, I guess we should put that here out there as well. We just closed the call, um, you know, I guess we closed it in January and we selected the cohort um, a week or two ago and we'll start the next, the first cohort for us at least in April. That will end in June or the end of June. And then we'll start all over again, looking for companies by about May that will join us in September. So uh, if, or, you know, if you didn't make it into the last cohort or you didn't apply, or you didn't know we existed or whatever the case may be, don't worry, you'll have another shot in a few months to apply and hopefully, um, yeah, we'll, we'll see how far that can go. So I think that's it. We've actually already done the introductions. Here are all of our, sorry, go back one slide, please. Here are all of our email addresses. So you can reach out to us, add us on LinkedIn. Like we're here basically to serve you. So just let us know like what we can do to help. And yeah, I guess with that, we'll open it up for any questions that anyone might have. All right, there's a question in the chat from Mac around the structure of the pitch deck. So is there a recommended structure for the pitch deck, especially if investors only spend three minutes on a deck? Yeah, maybe I'll jump in there. I mean, I think the structure should be whatever allows you to stand out at the end of the three minutes as someone that investors should be excited to talk to, right? I think the first thing to do is to kind of contextualize the pitch deck. Um, if it is a three minute pitch, usually what that means is that investors, you know, think about it. They have to see like two, 3,000 applications a year or something like that. Um, and they're not gonna have that much time to devote like an hour to each application. So what they do is they, or we or they, whatever you, how you wanna say it, um, like kind of divvy up the time so that we can kind of figure out really, really quickly um, 
whether or not we want to continue the conversation, right? So the idea is that first there's like the one minute pitch. If the one minute pitch goes well, maybe you get invited for like a three or a five minute pitch. If the three or five minute pitch gets goes well, maybe you're then invited for like a 30 minute chat or an hour chat. If that goes well, maybe we then introduce you to other team members because now we're willing to actually vouch for you or kind of fight for you. And if that goes well, you know, there's a due diligence process and all of that kind of stuff. So you have to think about like, you know, it's just about getting your foot in the door. And then each phase of the way you're trying to kind of get more and more of your body in the door till you're in, right? And that's kind of when you get the investment. Uh, so with the three minute pitch, what you're trying to do is to kind of incentivize or give people a reason to invite you to the next phase, which is hopefully a longer conversation, right? And I think for me, like what I, what usually stands out when people do it is, you know, um, if you can have a narrative structure in your pitch, that's usually good because people remember stories better than they remember random numbers. So like I wrote a, uh, an article over Christmas saying like founders should think like Jesus, you know, 2000 years later, regardless of what your religion is, we still remember uh, certain parables and stories from the Bible because they're simple stories that are easy to remember. If Jesus had just said a whole bunch of like, you know, other random things without kind of putting them into a narrative structure so you can remember characters, it will be more difficult 2000 years later to remember anything, right? So think about narratives and how you can use narratives um, and effective storytelling to get your point across relatively quickly. I think the second thing that's important is if there is a user uh, for your product, which hopefully there is, or someone that's buying your product, whatever, um, help us understand how they go from being really unhappy in the current, in the status quo to like ecstatic and super happy because of your solution. So if I can understand that journey from like, oh my God, life sucks um, to, oh my God, I'm so happy this iPhone was created or TikTok was created or whatever the product is that's making my life so happy because it's solving a major pain point for me or something. Um, that's kind of the journey I think it's useful to kind of share in there as well. Um, I think the third thing that a lot of founders uh, don't do sometimes or like that I would like to see more done more better, let's make it positive, is um, as you're doing the user journey bit, make sure that I really understand what the problem is that you're trying to solve. A lot of times founders are pitching and they're telling you about this really wonderful opportunity. They kind of start in the middle of the story and I don't even have the context and I'm not even sure like why I should care. But if you start with the problem and making sure that everyone understands like why this is a problem that we should all care about and why there's a lot of money to be made solving that problem, that's usually kind of an important bit as well. Um, and then if you have traction, that's the other part that I think it's really important to share. So sometimes you'll have a founder, we've seen this recently, where a founder has like, you know, half a million in, in, in revenue or $100,000 in revenue, whatever the number is. And then they don't tell you until the Q&A. And you're like, well, why didn't you tell me that before? I would have been probably more interested in listening more attentively if you had said that before. You know, there was one founder where she was like, even though this is a vanity metric, she had been like on like Oprah and I mean, maybe not Oprah, but like, you know, uh, Ebony and Vogue and the Today Show and all of that. And then that only came up like a, in the last minute of the Q&A. I think like as you're thinking through your pitch, just remember that it's a sales exercise and your job is to try and get people to engage with you and want to follow up with you. And so you should know what the key selling points of your business are, but at the very least, most fundamentally, I need to know what you're doing, why I should care, where the money is in that, um, do you have the product, does it work? Um, do you have traction? And then after that, who are you? Like, do I actually believe that you're the team or you're the people that are gonna be able to, to solve this problem? So I would say problem, solution, to, to give it like super concretely, Problem, solution, market, uh, traction, business model, and then um, team. It's kind of, I think, a formula that you see a lot. All right. Um, so I see other questions here. If anyone has questions that they would like to ask live, feel free to raise your hand on Zoom and we'll call on you. So we'll be looking at questions both in the chat as well as on the screen. So I'll go over to uh, Dana's question. Um, how does it work if you've applied and have not been selected, but since iterated that you've made progress, what needs to happen to get to that, uh, I guess, to get to yes, uh, Dana, that's your question. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Tanaka and Jonathan can answer this as well, but like, as we were going through the applications, we could actually see how far they had progressed in other kind of tech stars selection processes, you know, um, and we could also see like 
even if, you know, if they had been rejected. So for us, I think there were actually a couple of candidates who had been rejected from other programs. You know, in those situations, we might just call up the other MD and say, hey, what was going on? I think actually there were like two or three in our cohort where we saw something that someone else didn't. But you know what? Like, that's okay because I think most investors get it more wrong than right. So there's nothing to be, there's nothing shameful about getting rejected. I mean, that's kind of like par for the course when you're an entrepreneur, like 99 people will reject you and one person will see you. And then a lot of times that one person was the one that got it right. 99 people got it wrong. So we're not looking for whether or not you've been rejected before or whether or not someone else rejected you. Just make sure that when you're talking to us, um, that everything you do from the application, the answers to the questions, to if you get the interview, the way you prepare for the interview, to the screening committee. We even saw some people like flying into the screening committee. It wasn't in any way required, but just show that you're hungry and that you really want it every step of the way. And that becomes infectious at some point. And it doesn't make a difference if you fail before. That's entrepreneurship. I would say entrepreneurship is, is a scientific method applied to business. So it's not a failure, it's a lesson, right? And so we don't really care about, you know, the past lessons. If you didn't have any past lessons, that probably be, would be even worse. Yeah. And to add to that, I would say it would uh, be beneficial for you to connect with, you know, the team reviewing applications. So, you know, you have John on the call, you have Cord and myself, um, and we try to make ourselves available uh, during office hours. We are opening back our office hours in March um, after it, we finalize selection of this class, the April class. So, you know, follow us, you know, on social or reach out to us over email to request office hours because we actually do grant you that time. That being said, it is only 15 minutes. Um, so make sure that you're using that time to best position yourself, right? Um, we give you about three minutes to pitch your product, um, either using a deck or without it. And then we use the rest of the time to ask questions. And I think what you find in the application process, like Gary mentioned, is that many teams have applied to Techstars and been rejected the first or second time. Um, and sometimes, you know, different MDs look at different things, right? Um, in terms of their focus, um, you may have a, a city program that's only focused on that geography. So really to take some time to look at the program that you're applying for to understand the requirements. And then assuming, you know, you've met all the top level requirements of that geography, then make some time to reach out to the uh, team who's involved in sourcing to get on a call with them um, or come to forums such as these and then send a follow-up note. Yeah, I think one of the things that people don't say, but that, you know, I'll give you guys an insider scoop, is that there were like loads of people who actually didn't wait till the application process started to pitch us. And since our job is essentially to talk to founders, like, I'm not going to say no. I mean, that's part of the job, right? I'm like, well, thank you. And then a large number of the folks that kind of reached out to us, even before the process started, kind of, I would say they had a leg up, right? Because if you're reviewing an application and you've already spoken to someone, um, and you've asked all the questions that you that you that you have in your mind, and you think that they've been answered successfully, then that means that when you're reviewing the application, it becomes a lot easier, right? Um, and then going to the thought process of like this is a competition, the folks who haven't reached out to us, then all you have to go by are the words that they've been able to kind of like put down on paper, you know, within the space and time limits that they have. So you know, take every unfair advantage um, that you can and reach out to us. Like, there's nothing wrong with like reaching out beforehand and saying, hey. Like, I know the process hasn't started, but I'm really excited about Techstars and I'd love to talk to you. Do you have five or 10 minutes? The answer will probably always be yes. All right. I see a question from Maria Jose. Um, feel free to ask you a question. Sure. Thank you. Um, nice to meet you all. Um, well, my question is actually regarding the deck. Um, when we talk about three minutes, do you actually need any type of financials included or is that an extra that is not necessary to submit during um, the application process and will come out as we um, speak? So I think the way I think about that is like financials are kind of like not like the first thing is just remember the phase that we're talking about, right? These are like pre-seed companies. So if they have any indication of revenue, again, that's traction that's like looked upon very favorably. So that's number one. Um, I think like what's important to show is if you have any traction, um, if you have any revenue, how the how you make money, 
those are things obviously because I think that, that another thing that like founders do like I used to do myself sometimes to be fair is like you kind of get so excited about the idea and maybe even the product that you forget that the investor only really cares about how you make money right the others are kind of like um, only important to the extent that we get to the last bit, which is where is the money coming from and how much can we make? Um, so I think that, uh, you, can, you know, as you're thinking through the deck, like don't underestimate the importance of numbers. They don't have to be like audited accounts or anything like that, but you do want to have some sense as to like, does this founder have any intention of her from making money? Do they have any intention of making a lot of money? How do they plan on making a lot of money? How much money can they make? Those are the sorts of questions I think, and how are they going to make it? I think those are the sorts of questions that if you can answer um, in a couple of slides, then that's probably, you know, probably super useful. And I think the companies that generally tend to have revenue traction are the ones that do that the best. They're like, listen, we have 30 companies. We're charging each one $5,000. We have X amount in revenue and we're planning on our, that we're going after this particular segment, small businesses that are hair salons, and we're expecting revenue in 2023 of half a million dollars, which is 2X what we did last year. Like if you do that, like that doesn't take more than 30 seconds. It's super easy to understand it. The folks that kind of like run around in circles are the ones that then give you indications that they haven't really thought it through. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, it does. I, I can awesome. put my number. <laughs> okay. Perfect. All right, uh, I see a question from Mac. Love that question. Does Techstars invest in solo founders? Um, yeah, but, um, so what does that mean? It means that there are a lot of like investors that don't like to invest in solo founders. Obviously it means that there's a greater risk to the business because no person can do everything that's required in a startup by him or herself. It's like saying, can I win the Super Bowl by myself? No, you need to build out a team. I guess the question really becomes, do we believe that you have the capacity to build out the team? Do you have the awareness that you need to build out the team? I had like, I went to one event and a founder was like, why do I need a team when I can do it all myself? Well, that's probably a no right there. Um, so I think the question is like, do you have a, a sense of like humility to understand that you can't do this by yourself? Um, do you understand what profiles are going to need to be recruited? Do we actually believe that you're gonna be able to recruit those profiles because your pitch is good and you generally you know, seem like a, the kind of person that can inspire other folks? I think that those would be the sorts of things that you'd wanna see in a solo founder. Um, if you have a team, that's always preferable to a solo founder, right? Because it means that they can split the risk of burnout, um, that they can kind of share the responsibilities. It's unlikely that in a tech company, someone's gonna be a great CTO, CEO, a great CTO, a great manager, a, a business development person, and a great marketing person, as well as kind of think about the HR strategy. That's just not really going to happen in one person. So I guess what you're trying to do at the very earliest stage is, is figuring out, like, what are the absolutely essential skills that we need at this stage of the business? And who has those skills in the business? And if it's a solo founder, does that solo founder have the capacity to uh, recruit those other skills that are needed? But no one wants to invest in like a you know, a, a one-legged horse or whatever the case may be. It's like, we need to know that at some point, those risks are also going to be taken into account and that they're going to be people that we trust and believe in to be able to address those concerns. All right, can you say hello to me? Kataya, I didn't say hello to you. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening. Did you have a question, uh, Katia? Kataya, sorry if I'm saying that I, I'm sorry, I actually do not. I'm okay. sorry if I'm interrupting. My son is no, right no, no. here doing his homework. No, and worries, I don't no think worries. I was muted. Okay. So please accept my sincere apologies. <laughs> Happens to the best of us, don't worry. All good. Um, I don't think I see uh, questions in the chat. Okay, some more coming in. Um, I also see um, Annalisa. If you have a question, feel free to ask. I'll start with the one in the chat from Mac. Uh, thanks again, Mac, for the question. Question is, during due diligence, what are some of the key items that investors look for? All right. Awesome. I'm going to throw this one over to Jonathan because he's like a due diligence specialist. And so we'll give him a chance to yeah. talk as well. Yeah. I mean, uh, also just dovetail off Gary's uh, answer from before, right about stage, right? Because everything, a lot of what VCs do is oriented around that. So we're looking at pre-seed companies. So the diligence is very different than the, and you know that you'll face uh, in your C round and your A round, right? And so on. Um, I think for us, like just 
commenting because we just did and we are in the midst of doing uh, some diligence with our uh, portfolio companies. You know, uh, product demos are, I think, underrated in some ways. I know, I mean, to be fair, it depends. Like some companies, obviously, they spend a huge amount of time and effort on their demo. Uh, and I actually, if you asked me, like, I, I think that's a good strategy generally, um, have it, you know, where possible having like a, you know, depending on your product, obviously, but if it's software, having a literal software demo, we could walk me through it. Uh, if it's hardware, having some sort of a prototype, I mean, depending how hard that is, but we did see companies that had hardware prototypes, like prosthetic arms and stuff, right? They could physically hold them up and like, here it is. Uh, we had companies selling face creams, you know, whatever it is, like, just having the physical product though, whatever it is, being able to show it, uh, that it works, that it's real, that it's not, you know, vaporware, <laughs> that, uh, yeah, I, whatever, there's some unspoken thing there though that I think cannot be emphasized enough. Now, I and so from your diligence perspective, like, yeah, product diligence, right? Um, in terms of finance diligence, yeah, that varies. If you're reporting revenue, then obviously some sort of financial statements, records, uh, but even if it's just QuickBooks showing where the sales were recorded, I think is important. Um, it's not going to get you anything you don't deserve, right? But if you're reporting revenue, we'll want to see it at some point. Um, I think then in terms of market diligence, um, I, think, I think companies sometimes you'll see obviously there's almost like a template must be floating around somewhere where everyone has like the TAM and then like the SAM, right? And then so you have this like chart and it's very typical. Um, I think that's a place where people could put a little more effort um, rather than just quote some huge number, right? I mean, sometimes it's worth it, right? Because if you're doing, let's say I saw a global logistics company, it's like, you know, 50 trillion. It's like, okay, it's like, that's, I mean, it's cool. Cause like, that's huge. Like, sure, talk about it. Uh, and certainly if you're in a space where there, if you think there may be questions about the size of the market, I think that's another place to address those, like on that slide and that discussion. Um, so hit that head on. Don't pretend, like, don't think they're just going to forget about it because they won't. Um, but I think there's a lot more you could do in the market sizing space uh, to try to show a little bit more bottoms up. Like, uh, I think we had someone on their deck, like, you know, obviously often if they have customers, they'll show customers, that's fine. But they also showed like the breakout of the customers. So they showed, for instance, uh, we're selling to like this division of this pharmaceutical company and they paid us X, right, over this period. And it's kind of like, okay, like, you know, it's not hard, like you already did it. So elucidating that for the investor real fast, though, I think is a major diligence marker. Um, and then there's team diligence. I think in the pre-seed stage, you know, it's not, we're maybe a little less there, but certainly in like it's not a diligence thing it's more like a that's going to be probably discussed as a major component of the pitch itself right because we're going to know like who is this founder like why are they particularly organically suited to solve this problem um and what is their background and such so sorry this is a huge question but i hope i try to put a bow on something no, i think that was awesome i mean and as jonathan was speaking the other thing i remembered um though it came into my mind i should say um is that like sometimes as women and people of color and I people some people don't like this, it's a little bit harder. So I think like for me, like what I've seen is, you know, for female founders, like I think the numbers are particularly important. And the same thing for black founders actually, and, and minority founders in general, like not maybe not all minority groups suffer from the same stereotypes. But I think that sometimes what I've seen as a founder myself and then also like being in the room is that like there's a kind of distrust of the ability of the person to actually come up with a viable business model, right? Um, I've had some female founders say to me that they have to get like a white guy from HBS to be their CFO to kind of make sure that investors feel comfortable with the fact that they're going to be handling the money. Um, so I think like, you know, we live in the world the way it is, not the way we would like it to be. And I think that, you know, going into the fact of, or thinking this through is like kind of like, a competition. It's always an uphill battle. I think that's the thing you have to start with, right? It's an, up, an uphill battle for all founders. Getting funding is difficult for white guys, black guys, Latinos, everyone. It's just like, it's more difficult for certain groups. And so I think like what that means then is you just need to make sure that you're playing the game properly. And that if you know that there are certain folks that may have different presumptions about what you might be able to bring to the table, you can do two things. One is that when you're selecting your investors, select the investors that you don't think you have to worry about those sorts of things with. 
right? Um, but then secondly, in the real world, that there may not be enough of those. So then if you do go up um, against kind of like other investors who may not understand why digital female, you know, femtech is a relevant thing, you know, I've actually seen this, um, or why supporting kind of underrepresented founders or helping underrepresented communities is a good thing, um, then maybe you need to pitch it to them, not from the point of view of it's a good thing to do, but from the point of view of there's a lot of money to be made, it's a huge market, and here's why you should be taking that more seriously, but without sounding in any way condescending. So I think to Jonathan's point, sometimes when you belong to certain groups, I almost feel like you have an extra responsibility or need to kind of um, make sure that you're crystal clear on the numbers and you're crystal clear on the market, particularly if the target market that you're going after is not like, let's call it the majority group. All right, I saw a question from Annalisa. I don't know if you still have it. Oh no, I didn't have a question. I was oh, okay. uh, I was <laughs> laughing at Kaitia when she said about her son earlier because I'm the program manager for the program that she's in. So I'm, oh. I'm I see two of my founders have questions, so I don't want to take up any of their time. Oh, lovely. Okay, wonderful. Well, I'm gonna pass it over to Dawn. I think you had your hand up first, and then we'll go to um, Whipped Lash in the chat. <laughs> uh, thank you and happy Taco Tuesday, everybody. Please excuse my appearance. I'm in the process of moving and it snowed here in Los Angeles and it's cold and we're not used to this weather. Um, so I have a very specific personal question. So um, bear with me. I am CEO of Mellow Scene and we provide virtual music studios um, for musicians. They can record there, create, collaborate, and buy fans in and monetize their art. Um, I have two co-founders. Um, one was in the music industry for about 20 years. Um, the other managed him and happens to be married to him as well. And so uh, we are in uh, starting our seed phase and um, Julie and I are having a difference of opinion on how to fund the round. Um, I know that we need to have terms when we are presenting to investors of, you know, we're trying to raise $3 million and um, I don't mind safe agreements. And uh, my partner is in business school and uh, her entrepreneurship professor is telling her not to do safe agreements, only doing a priced round. Um, I think we need to have options, but what do y'all think? What are your thoughts on that? Thank you. Thanks for the question. I'm trying to see if I have like a magic bullet answer, which I think I don't. I think like probably what I would say is like, that's one of those things where if we could get you into like an office hours so for 15 minutes, like we could probably answer that more specifically because on the one hand Techstars offers notes so I can't say that those are terrible because you know um, a lot of people use them but there may be circumstances where a price round makes more sense um, I think it would just depend on the individual circumstance and so super happy for you to reach out to any of us on the team and see if we can kind of like just talk you through in a more kind of because they're also personal questions that I'd ask like, how, what percentage of company do you have? Like, obviously if she and her husband own like 80% of the company and you own like 20 or 10 or whatever the case may be, well, it's kind of a moot question, right? Like, should they have the power of determining how it's gonna go? They don't need your sign off. So I think like rather than having a kind of like generalized conversation about this or a specific question, I should say, um, just reach out and let's have that conversation where I can ask you more details and more questions. Okay, we will do, thank you. Thanks. And uh, we'll pop our um, emails in the chat so you have them done and everyone else on the call. Next question is from Whiplash. I see you came off of mute, so feel free to ask your question. Ah, okay, or I can read your question if easier. All right, question from Whiplash is, um, is tech stores for New York City based startups only? Do you consider New York and surrounding areas? Yes, I think we covered this in the deck a little bit where we kind of showed the last cohort where I don't remember the numbers because today was the first time I saw some of them, but like um, in, I think it was like less than half of the cohort came from New York City, about like 58% came from the US, 42% came from the rest of the world. So there is no requirement that uh, the companies come from New York City. What we're looking for are really awesome companies 
that for whatever reason are gonna leverage the New York City ecosystem, regardless of whether or not they're currently based there or not. Yeah, and to add to that, um, I'm not sure if the question was asking specifically about our team or tech stars in general, um, but you know, as Gary mentioned in the call, Techstars runs about 54 programs globally. And some of those programs are specific uh, to specific cities um, and some are agnostic. So our program is again, agnostic in terms of geo, like geography, agnostic in terms of sector, though, as you saw from you know, the, the presentation, there are some sectors that we were particularly excited about that we invested in for our first inaugural class. Um, but to your point, um, founders from anywhere, US, international um, are invited to apply. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to, is it Kant G? Yeah, the T is silent, but oh, everybody, everybody <laughs> murders it. So I just don't even, you know, say whatever you want. My apologies. Um, no, 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 my name is Kanji Anthony. I am uh, the CEO and co-founder of Udall. Um, we connect retailers with shoppers during their search for a product in real time. So my question is, um, you know, you, you touched on storytelling, Gary, and I just wanted to know if you could just go a little bit deeper. Oh, I should also mention I was, um, I'm a digital undivided fellow and that's how I found out about this. But um, do you mind going into the components of storytelling, um, you know, just making sure that you're touching on the points that can, you know, reach an investor? Yeah, no, so I think like the storytelling, like is, it's like form versus substance, right? I think the storytelling is really a question more of form. And then the investor points are more a question of substance, right? So uh, the point of storytelling is not because there's a specific kind of path. It's, it's more about how do you tell a memorable story that engages an audience with the audience in this case, presumably being an investor. Other audiences could be a corporate, it can be a journalist, it can be an employee. There are lots of different audiences. And the question is, what's the format that you should choose to increase the likelihood of conversion, which in that case means that the person that you're talking to does what you want them to do, right? Well, the first thing is they have to remember you when you finish. Um, and the second thing is they need to understand what you do and what you want from them. And, and hopefully there's some sort of a match. So I think that's more what I mean by storytelling. I don't think that there's a prescription to storytelling. I think sometimes people do it in the form of, let me tell you about Sarah. Sarah is one of my major clients and here's how, why she needs me. So like the best, actually the best, one of the best stories I saw in the last um, iteration of, of, of applications was, you know, it was a really personal story. The CEO had cancer and then, she met her doctor. And then after she had cancer, she and her doctor decided that they were gonna create a startup to deal with this cancer that lots of women have, right? Um, and so one investor turned around to me in the screening committee and said, they should just take my money right now, right? Because the thing is, that's a story that really resonated with the investors, um, in that case, particularly like the female investors. Um, and secondly, it was memorable. They were still talking about it after the pitch. So I think that's the value of storytelling, which is making it memorable. They could have easily gotten up there and said, you know, uh, cervical cancer affects X number of women per year and leads to Y number of deaths and whatever. And you'd be like, okay. But when they told that story, you were like, oh, you felt like personally and emotionally involved. And that means that like they were actually the company that had probably the least traction, but they got the, the second highest number of votes because the story resonated, they were memorable, and you want to see them succeed. So I think storytelling is more a form question. Now the substance question, I think I answered before, which is like, so make sure that story is good, but I understand what's the problem? Why should I care? You know, um, how exactly does your solution work? So I can kind of understand how the person who had the problem now feels like your solution is the definitive answer to their problems. Um, how big is the market? Uh, do you have any traction? How do you make money and why you? If I can get all of that in three minutes, that sub those substantive points, that's awesome. Wrapped up in a story that I can actually remember and communicate to my friends afterwards the same way I'm communicating a story to you, right? Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Right, I'm gonna go back in the chat. I see a question from Patricia on 
the convertible note. So what are circumstances where a convertible note makes more sense? Yeah, I'm going to dodge this one probably <laughs> because like I said, Techstars uses a note. So I'm not going to say anything against a note, obviously. Um, I think notes tend to work well when you're talking with about early stage companies with no existing valuation. Um, you know, that's that's the way I would say it. Like, I think it, it, they probably work less well when you have founders who have already had a price round and the assumptions as to price in the um, in the note do not correlate nicely with what the happened in the price round already, right? So I think like there's some points where a, a note can be really bad for founders, and there's some points at which founders probably don't really care that much about um, the note. And I think like in in all cases, um, this becomes a mute a moot question if you have lots of different options, right? I think like the real question here is when is it when does a note make sense? when it's the only offer on the table, you know, or when it's one of the only offers on the table, um, then of course, like you don't really have that much leverage. If you have lots of leverage, then probably you can then ask this question in a different sort of way. And then it probably depends, like I said before, on the specifics of each case. Um, but yeah, that's that's what I would say. In general, if you already have like a price round and your valuation of your price round is higher than the valuation implicit in the note, such that it might be considered that you're taking a down round or that the subsequent investors getting a better deal than the earlier investor, um, those may be situations where people might ask certain questions. All right. Um, I think we're coming up on time, uh, but wanted to see if there are more questions uh, for the team, either in the chat or on the Zoom. I have one little one question, if that's okay. Yeah, go ahead. A couple of minutes. Um, I, you talked about it, Carrie, uh, very clearly about being um, a minority or a person of color, and I see that it's amazing to see the stats of the cohort that you're bringing into your inaugural program. You know, the reality is that a lot of these they're all women that we support here in this program. They all are women of color. How do you? help build the stamina or what advice do you give to them on withstanding some of the adversities that they are facing and trying to fundraise? And I mean, you know, I don't want to dance around the topic because that's really why a lot of them are here. So I love any closing advice that you might have for tonight. Yeah. I'm like, you know, in a lot of ways, I'm always like, what would Beyonce do? And I think like, you know, the line that I take away is always stay gracious, best revenge is your paper. Right. Because I think like the pressures that you face being a trailblazer in any industry, you know, you know, Serena Williams, Beyonce, like uh, what's her name? Simone Biles, you know, any number of like I, I watch a JLo special, you know, on Netflix. It's kind of like there are always pressures that you face when you're trying to do something that very few people before you have done and that very few people in general can do. Right. Like, again, like the numbers when it comes to who gets venture capital funding. The majority of white guys don't get venture capital funding either, right? The overwhelming majority of people don't get access to it. So it's not a racialized thing. It's just simply that the race and gender element add additional burdens to something that's already really, really, really difficult and unlikely, right? Um, and so I think like in that same way, you know, my sister and I were talking about Beyonce at the Grammys when they keep like basically denying her record of the year or whatever, or any of the major categories. And it's basically like, still stand up and be gracious. I think like, you know, and this is going to be the real advice and people could call me out for it or whatever. Sometimes I personally get turned off of, against like minority and women founders when they get hyper aggressive, right? So there was an event that I went to last night and I was like, just because you feel adversity doesn't mean that you have to approach the world with that on your sleeve, right? Because again, to the extent that like most of these businesses are super discretionary, like you have the luxury of choosing one out of a hundred right? And you're going to want to work with people that make you feel comfortable, who you want to see su succeed, who you want to see win, to the extent that people bring any level of, I don't know, kind of like bad feeling to it, um, then you're just like, listen, I'm not into this. And as much as I'm like for minorities and women and stuff like that, if someone comes at me that way, I'm just, I just come off. I'm like, life is too short. I don't really have time for your negative energy, right? So I think like, for me, the number one tip is it's really hard. We know that, um, you know, stay gracious. I looked at Michelle Obama trying to be first lady or uh, being successfully first lady of the United States afterwards, writing the book Becoming, talking about how difficult that was. Stay gracious. 
You don't have to kind of attack, go on the attack. If you do that, you're actually just doing yourself a disservice. So that's kind of the number one thing I think, which is be like Beyonce, be gracious, kind of like just don't give people extra reasons to not want to see you win. And then I think the second tip I'd give is know how the game is played. You know, like you might be a wonderful athlete, but if you don't know how tennis is played, you're never, you know, someone, you have to know the rules and there's no um, shortcutting learning the rules of the game. So there are particular, there's a particular language, vernacular, um, rules of becoming a venture backable company. And I think like to the extent possible, you have to know those rules because no one's gonna change those rules for you, right? Um, so you have to know the rules and use environments like this to ask questions that you're afraid to ask in other contexts because a lot of times we're afraid of like looking silly or being exposing ourselves as some sort of like fraud or whatever the case may be. Um, I think like in environments like this, you don't need to. And if you're still kind of worried about it, just reach out to one of us individually and then ask the questions that you really want to ask there, but don't go into rooms with investors not fully armed by at least knowing the rules of the game, rules of engagement, because you will lose. Um, and, and it will be something that might've been potentially avoidable. I, I don't know if that helps. Yeah. Amazing. That was exactly what I was looking for. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. All right. Awesome. So I think, I'll oh, go ahead, Patricia. No, I was just going to say any last minute questions. If not, thank you to Gary and his team for joining us in this AMA session, as well as providing a safe, inclusive environment to ask any um, questions that you guys had. Um, I wanted to quickly share with you guys our also our upcoming sessions. Um, so we have another a digital and divided session this Thursday called Planning for Parental Leave with the Expecting Entrepreneur. Learn about how to plan for parental leave for you and your team, um, as well as on Tuesday, March 14th, we'll have a session specifically on R&D taxes and what that means. So scan the, scan the QR code if you guys uh, would like to sign up for those. That is it for me. Thank you guys so much for joining. See you guys next time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Okay, cheers.